So I'd like to introduce our, our two panelists uh, in this dialogue. Uh, Howard Buffett, Chairman and CEO of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation. Okay, and Sir Gordon Conway is back on. Thank you. Gentlemen, I turn it over to you. <laughs> we, we're using this, I take it. Okay. Well, um, you all know who I am. You sure as hell know who he is. And we're going to try and have a dialogue which is interesting and informative and at times funny, at times sad. Howard can do funny and sad both at once. He, he's well known for his knowledge, skills, and expertise in farming. And he's also well known as a stunning photographer. Those, those two things in his life, and we'll talk about that a bit later. He's done other things. He was a county commissioner in Nebraska. He was uh, VP of Archer Daniels, Mid Daniels Midland and worked for them for quite a long time. He's a director of Berkshire Hathaway, and he's been a director so this morning when I talked about microdosing, I had to talk about Coca-Cola because he was coming along. And he's also very experienced in philanthropy. And that's, in a sense, our only connection because I've got a sissing, sissing, sissing. Is that better? There. Oh, what a great audience. And... Um, he, uh, that's our connection because I was president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And he's got many awards, and one of them I just want to mention now is the Order of the Aztec Eagle, which is the highest honor awarded to a foreigner by the Mexico government. And so I think that's a marvelous thing to have. He's written about seven or eight books. Uh, many of them are full of his photographs. There's a wonderful one about the mountain gorilla, another one about life stories of people. And then the latest book is this one called 40 Chances. And as you can see, I've read it. It's got some wonderful things in there. And I want to start off, Howard, by asking you, what do you mean by 40 Chances? Well, uh, um for farmers that are here, they'll appreciate this. I was, one winter I went down to Sloan Implement where I buy most of my farm equipment uh, in Assumption, Illinois, a little town. And they had us gather in the back and they had a speaker there. And um, he got everybody's attention because he said, you guys really aren't thinking about this right when you're farming. And he said, what you need to understand is when you get on the tractor when your dad lets you learn how to plant and you get on the tractor for the first time and you start planting on your own to the time you get off that planter and you let your son or daughter get on and plant you've got about 40 seasons or 40 chances to plant the best crop you can plant and I had never thought about it like that when I walked out of there I honestly did things differently on my farm but it, it, it really hit me that life is very similar to that I mean by the time you get through school um, and you get you know a job or two that you really are learning at, you get about 40 prime years to do something. Now, I, I did have to revise that. When we did the book tour, I had my father with me in New York for a few days, and I would, I would say this, and he would give me this dirty look like, I got a lot more than 40. So it's all relative, Gordon, but um, you know, I mean, truthfully, we, we have probably 40 or so prime years to, to go out and make the difference we wanna make in the world, to build a legacy, to help as many people as we can, whatever your goals are. Um, it's a finite time period, and the, it's the fact that it's a finite time period is what drives my thinking, which is you really need to be urgent and vigilant about what you do. Well, I was gonna get to you about the 40, too, because I started work growing cocoa in Borneo in 1961. So I'm in my 53rd choice. And the reason for that is... Well, I hope I'm like you. But <laughs> well, the reason for that is that there's, there always seems to me to be so many fantastic challenges and problems ahead that you need to cope with along the way and that you ought to take on. 
And so I hope that you aren't going to stop at 40. Well, I don't, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. But you said something that's important, which is there are so many challenges. And probably one of the toughest lessons I've tried to learn, and I still haven't learned it, is how to stay focused. It's, it's so easy to get distracted. Um, and I have some of uh, the, the people who helped me at the foundation here, and they're probably all smiling because anywhere I go, I get an idea. And it's, they're always trying to be... My son did this uh, when he was at the foundation for two years. You know, he was drawing charts and showing me where this stuff's way over here and this stuff's way over there. Get back here. And, and you, can, you can get distracted really easily. So, but, but what's... How do you stay focused? I mean, is it because you've got staff that, or a spouse or somebody that really... I'm not talking about my spouse here. Right. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think that you learn it. I mean, I've learned that over 20 years of trying to give money away that to be effective, all the problems that we work on are so big. So to be effective, you have to focus. And... Um, so sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. But, but what, what we do, um, the way we're going to have impact is to do things at scale. And if we're going to do it at scale, then we really have to stay focused. Okay. Now, but also, I get the sense that you don't necessarily believe in carefully planning each of these chances. I mean, you're a great, you're a great one for jumping in and for trial and error. Is that right? Yeah, well... There, there's a few things I've done that people might think are irresponsible, but um, I just, I want to learn. And the way you learn is you just do it. And we started, we've, we've invested $80 million in research farms in South Africa, uh, Illinois, Nebraska, and Arizona. When I started, I could not tell you exactly where I wanted to get. But what I knew is every year I don't do it, I lose the opportunity. So it wasn't a perfect start, and we're still trying to get it right. But we have five years under our belt now of knowledge we would not have had otherwise. And so a lot of things are like that. And the one thing about me is I'm not scared to fail. You know, there's a lot of things I've not done right, but there's a lot of things I would never have gotten done if I hadn't have jumped in and just done it. And I think probably, we were talking about this earlier, one of the biggest challenges in philanthropy today is people don't want to take risk. Our money, as a private foundation, as you well know, you ran one of the largest ones for a long time. As a private foundation, our money has to be the risk capital. We have to be willing to go out and fail time and time again. And, you know, this, this entire institution was built on failure, not success. It was built on failure because the only way you can get to success is, is to try innovative things, things that are out of the box, things that aren't going to work, and then you get to success. And there's no one who would know that better than, than Dr. Borlaug, who, you know, he would, he would probably tell you hundreds of failures that he had. But it led to one of the biz, biggest successes in the world. You, you know, at times you sound a bit like Hu Jintao, the former president of China. I bet nobody's ever said that to you before. But No. <laughs> I don't speak Chinese either. But <laughs> well, he, he says that that's how you should develop, is through trying things, and if something works, you scale it up. If something doesn't work, you, you put it on one side. That's a real problem when you're trying to train people, isn't it, in a university? I mean, in my case, I'm trying to train people to be analytical and work it all out and do controlled experiments along the way. Should I be actually saying, no, well, don't do that? Well, that's why I'd never make a scientist. Um, I, well, I think you have to give people enough freedom to fail and you have to you have to protect them when they fail um, you know I, I remember I, I remember when I was at Archer Daniels Midland at ADM uh, I had a tough boss a very famous guy and uh, a legend in agriculture and 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 Dwayne you know would let us fail I mean he, he would say go out and try to do this and we'd come back and I think oh man this is it and he would never treat me like that he would say what did you learn what aren't you going to do next time? What are you going to do differently? And so he always saw it as a lesson and an opportunity to, to be smarter the next time you do something. And I just think generally our society doesn't operate that way. Certainly philanthropy doesn't operate that yeah. way. Yeah. I, I'm, but just going to, 
perhaps at universities we should be setting things up so that students do things which are extremely risky and then learn from it. But in the philanthropy world, we've now got ourselves in a state where everything has to be measured and evaluated. I mean, at Rockefeller, we didn't do that in, in that sort of precise way. And if we had failures, we told the board we had failures, and they said, did you learn from it? And we'd say yes, and they thought that was all right. But there's a lot you can't... You measure success in the United States by the number of hectares of land that conservation farming is practiced? It, it's simple. I mean, let, let me just go back to the first. I'll answer that. But the, the first part of what you said, we, so we've got... 4,400 acres in Illinois, and it doesn't sound like much in Arizona, 1,400 with nine pivots, but we're farming in a desert, and that's a challenge. And, and then 9,000 acres in South Africa. And what we've learned is, and we have some great partners, Penn State, uh, University of Missouri, um, uh, Purdue, I mean others, and, 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 and what we've learned is, is, particularly in Illinois, with Southern Illinois University, is you have researchers and then we're trying to farm it and man do we have head-on collisions and and my i draw a line in the sand sometimes. i say look you can research all you want but if i can't use it on my farm and it doesn't help me and it doesn't do me any good then go home and so we have some really head-butting sessions because what they want to do in research doesn't match what i want to do as a farmer but i keep telling them if you can't, you can research all you want, but if it doesn't help me at the end of the day or doesn't help other farmers at the end of the day, all you're doing is spending somebody's time and money. And so I think there is a gap in terms of research and really applied learning and changes in, um, in agriculture. I'm not saying this because I'm sitting here today, but I mean, Simit is actually an amazing example of how they've done that and how they've taken the research and changed many, many, many production systems in the lives of people by, by increasing productivity. It can be done, but most academic institutions don't think that way. And, and, and I think it's a challenge because there's huge amounts of money spent on this that never transfer into changed behavior or better productivity. But farmers sometimes get it wrong. Right? No. <laughs> No, we get okay. it wrong all the time. Okay, okay. I was going to come up with an example, but I'd better stop for the moment. When, when you were young, you, with all due respect, you were what in Britain we would call a bit of a tearaway. You, you, you behaved in all kinds of ways, and you write about it in the book, which I think is extraordinary to actually admit all the wrong things you did. I suppose it's all part of your trial and error. But you were, the statute of limitations on most things have expired. <laughs> but, but when you were young, you were fascinated by heavy metal, not the rock music, but by great big machines. You loved great big machines. You used to play with Tonka trucks, right? Now, I mean, how did... And that's how you got into agriculture, actually. It wasn't because you were interested in farming. You were interested in driving machines. And you just told me recently you were in Western Sahara, and what happened? Well, well, we were, I had one country left to, to be in every country on the continent of Africa, and it, it was uh, Mauritania. So on the way to Mauritania, I wanted to go to Western Sahara. I had visited the Swahari refugee camps in Algeria, and I kind of wanted to get to Western Sahara. So we went there, and um, the mining company, OPC, took us to show us their uh, phosphate mine, which actually is a huge thing in the future of agriculture, huge. And now you would never do this in, in the United States, they'd never let you do this because we have OSHA and all these other regulatory agencies. But I'm watching this D9N push these huge piles of phosphate up. And I asked the guy, I said, can I go run that bulldozer? And he looked at me, he says, you know how to do that? And I said, oh yeah, I know how to do it. I said, I'll get in and it'll be a three speed power shift. And you know, I, I mean, I know how to run it. The guy actually, walks me over, stops the guy, lets me get the bulldozer, and I start running it, and then he couldn't get me out, but I mean, you know, um, but to me, you know, it is what got me into agriculture, because I loved equipment, and then I had a farmer, um, Mr. Dinsdale, from out in central Nebraska, who, who 
I was working in California, and I, I got two weeks of vacation, and I asked him if I could come back and work on his farm for my vacation, and I came back, and um, the only disappointing part was he had a lot of old junk equipment. I kind of like new equipment, but anyway. So I did what I did, and he said to me, he says, Howie, he says, one day it won't be about the equipment. It'll be about learning and understanding and appreciating that you're growing something and that you're running a business and that it all fits together and that you're making an impact on the world by feeding people. And I've never forgotten that. And I thought, you know, I kind of listened to him like you do when you're young and think, yeah, whatever. And then it did change. I mean, that really did change. And, and so to me, farming, it's, it's not just a profession. It's not a business. Um, it, and, and I don't mean to be, you know, you, you can't also be overly nostalgic about it, but um, it is the important, prof most important profession in the world. I mean, if people can't eat and they can't have water, um, they're not going to get anything else done. So I think one of the biggest disappointments I've seen when I've gone around the world is that many governments don't appreciate farmers. And if they did, we wouldn't have so many poor farmers in the world. But farmers in general don't get enough But farmers, big and small, don't often get enough reward for what they're doing. I mean, even in somewhere like Iowa, if you've only got 500 acres, which is, by British standards, you know, huge, you, your spouse has got to get another job, otherwise you can't survive. It's only when you've got five or 6,000 acres you can survive. So it's really tough for farmers, whether it's big farmers or small farmers. Now, what can you do about that? Well, I, I, it's interesting because in the United States, um, I'll say up right, right up front, I'm a Republican. So when I get accused of being a socialist for this comment, it's not true. But um, I see a trend in the United States that I personally don't like. I mean, I, I think that um, I see rural areas in our country that are degrading. School systems have to consolidate. You have less of a tax base is, is, is what's driving it. And you have less choices in rural America as a farmer as to who you're going to buy product from and who you get your knowledge from. And so as we just get bigger and bigger, I don't really see that as a great goal. And, and there's no magic number and there's no, you know, it's, it, there's no magic number at all about, you know, what's a great size or what's a good size. But if we're going to start talking about conservation agriculture and protecting our natural resources and protecting our soil and protecting our water quality and making sure that we are here to produce in 50 years, you know, or 100 years for the next generations and generations, then you got to do it right. And I've learned, you know, I like big too, but I've learned that sometimes you can be too big. And, and, and it's not, I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm just saying that I think our system has perpetuated uh, growth that is is not the healthiest system in the world and then on the other extreme you have when I first I can't remember what country I was in first when I saw this but when I saw farmers that could not feed their family I thought this is wrong this is just not right and it's so complex that there's no easy way to talk about it and say these are the solutions it's very complex but when you have a billion farmers in the world that can't feed their family and they go to bed hungry, their kids go to bed hungry, and sometimes they have hunger periods of two or three or four months, that's not right. So, you know, we have to figure out how to do better at that. And it's not, there's no easy solution to that. Yeah, I, I was in southern Ethiopia recently and uh, a farmer there, she got a, a seed, maize seed from Pioneer. And when she um, planted it and put diammonium phosphate on it, she could get two or three tons, which is pretty good because she normally only gets less than one ton per hectare. But then they discovered that if you put the NPK in the right mixture and you add boron, which is deficient there, she could get six to eight tons of maize per hectare. That's the European average. So in many cases, they can feed themselves. So the question is, What's the biggest obstacle, do you think? Well, but let me give you the, another example of the other side of that. I was in Sierra Leone once, and I met a woman who was supporting 14 people. There were two families and a number of kids, and she said, 
I don't know what I did wrong. And she pulled out some ears of corn that looked like I would have grown in Illinois. I said, well, where'd you get the seed? And she said, I got it in town. And of course, like a dumb Westerner, I said, well, do you have the bag you bought it in? And it looks at me like, you know, oh, I bought it in a tin cup, you know, and I, and because I was trying to figure out like what variety it was, where did it come from? And after enough discussion, she thought it came from Nigeria down to Sierra Leone and, you know, they don't know. So I said, well, what do you mean? What did you do wrong? And she said, well, come look at my plants. And she had plants that were just not in good condition at all. And so I started talking to her, and what had happened was she had gotten the improved seed. Somehow she'd gotten a little bit of fertilizer, but then she didn't, the, the next year she didn't have the improved seed. She replanted the seed, and she didn't have access to the fertilizer and couldn't afford the fertilizer. So her answer was, now that I can't grow what I was growing, I'm going to go over here, and she pointed, and I'm going to tear out some of these trees so I have newer soil. So therein lies the problem. You know, how do you get the change that has to take place and the commitment from the government that has to take place that you don't, you can't drop in in the middle of somewhere with a parachute and say, here's some fertilizer, here's some improved seed, good luck. Because the next year or the year after, something will go wrong and, and they don't have access on a continual basis. So you've got to have the government policy, you've got to have the government commitment, the government funding, along with the private enterprise, the foundations and everybody else. But if you're missing that fundamental foundation of the government, then you're not going to get it right long term. And, and we have every example in the world now. You can, you can, I mean, Brazil is the most modern day example, in my opinion, of what the commitment they made and what they've changed in their agriculture. And the United States is one of the oldest examples. And so it, it's not rocket science what we have to do. But it is rocket science on how you get it done, because it's just not easy to do it. A lot of that's about political leadership. I mean, that was what Norm Bollard was able to get behind him, the leaders of Pakistan, and India, and, and, and the Philippines. Um, in Africa today, you've got somebody like uh, John Kafour and so on. But there's not a lot of really strong political leaders. And, and that seems to me you can't get a get very far unless you've got that leadership. Well, you, you can get me in a lot of trouble on this one, but, um, you know, you have to have leadership that, number one, recognizes the value that farmers bring and that small farmers, not that they'll all stay far, small farmers, but that small farmers are part of the solution, not the problem. And so a lot of African leaders, in my opinion, look at the United States or Europe, Australia, today Brazil, Argentina. We want to look like them. But the truth is, we all actually look a lot more different if you break it down than they might think we look or by lumping us together. So Africa has to look like Africa should look. And we can't define that. Africa needs to define it, but they won't define it until they have that leadership. And so that is the biggest hurdle. And we find it in some of the countries, we, we, we tend to work in some pretty tough countries. And it is a leadership issue, but it, it, it's complicated because it's a land ownership issue. Land ownership is huge, it's huge. And so it's, a, it's an access to capital issue. It's, it's a governance issue in some places, um, you know, it, it's certainly, um, Ghana is a good example where it's also a tribal issue in terms of how tribal laws affect and interact and have an impact on common law. So it is complex, but, but I do, I, I, I mean, how you change leadership is not easy. I mean, we work with um, one of your guys who, um, I won't ask your opinion, but uh, Tony Blair uh, from your home country who really has started an amazing, uh, I think an amazing organization, Af AGI, African Governance Initiative. And we've worked with him in a number of countries. And he's doing, he is doing what has to change. But he can't do it if a government doesn't want him to do it. And so, you know, he's been able to get into six, seven, eight governments and really start to see things um, that can change. But what, you're, what you put your finger on is the toughest single question and issue. And, until you have leadership, you don't have much. They've got, I mean, they've now got CADAP in Africa, the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, 
Yeah. So, quite a number of countries, 20, 30 countries, have got good plans out there. Now, let me. There's one country in Europe which I will not identify. Right? What is said. The future of Africa lies in industrialization and in urbanization. And uh, that's what we should be investing in. We don't need to invest in agriculture. That'll all get sorted out as they industrialize. Uh, do you want some words of advice to that uh, country? Yeah, I'd hang the guy. I mean, <laughs> I, I, mean I, I mean, this is a guy who goes to the grocery store and has one on every corner and has never put his kids to bed hungry. I mean, that, it, it's ignorance. And I don't even know who you're talking about, and I'm sure I'll get a letter or something. But, um, you know, it, it, it really is ignorance. First of all, go to a country, you can pick 100 countries, but, but, but pick, pick Kenya, okay? Go into Nairobi, and you look at what urbanization has done in that city. If you aren't prepared to take Hundreds and th look right in this country. Go to go down to, to to Mexico City, DF. Go down there. You know, if you aren't prepared for the people that are going to come in, and you don't have the sewer system, and you don't have the water system, and you don't have the streets, and you don't have the jobs, and jobs is a critical part of it, you've got a disaster. And I don't know who he thinks is going to grow the food, whoever this he or she or this person is, but. Farmers are the backbone of every society, and I don't care whether they're bigger, smaller, if they've, you know, if they're in transition, it doesn't matter. If you want to eat food, you need somebody to grow it for you. And so I would take a guy like that and um, put him to work on a farm, let him figure it out. Okay, I'll see if it can be made to happen. Now, you, we talked about the complexity of all these challenges. You know, and in agricultural development, you're talking about seed, you're talking about soils, you're talking about land tenure, you're talking about etc. Now, just let's start with seed. You know, there's a lot of small seed companies coming up in Africa now, like Victoria Seeds in Uganda, which is outstanding. And in your book, you, you have a whole chapter devoted to Joe de Vries, who we both know, who's a fanatic about seeds. Uh, knows more about them than anybody. Do you want to just say something about your experiences of working with Joe? Well, Joe is an amazing guy. I mean, in my opinion, the guy's a hero. Um, he has put his life on the line early in his career to get farmers better seeds. And, and he saw some of his colleagues killed in the process. This is a guy who is the real thing. I mean, you know, and um, he is a fanatic about it. Um, I was very tricky because we have this great debate on soils. I said, you know, Joe, I love your seeds. They're great. Um, but you got to remember, farming is a biological ecosystem. So you, you, you got you to gotta treat it that way. And you got to take everything into consideration. Seeds, seeds, seeds. You know, that's all I said. So I got him down. We were on a trip to Brazil, and I gave him this hat that says, Got Dirt, Get Soil. And I took a picture of him with it, and it's in the book. I heard about it, um, but you know he—he he is an amazing guy because what he's doing is he's he, look. That's a rock, you know this, but everybody should know this. But it's a Rockefeller program. I mean, I mean, Pass was a Rockefeller program. It would not be here today if it weren't for for, for you and your colleagues, and it's probably the greatest program we fund relative to what it does where we are, because it's the opposite of a typical NGO program. And we did lots of these NGO programs when we started out. I didn't know any better. I, it was a painful lesson because it was also an expensive lesson. But I learned it in Angola back in 2005 that it just was not the solution if you wanted to feed, if you had to do this at scale. What Joe's doing is he is building a seed business and he's building hundreds of seed entrepreneurs. He's, he's helping entrepreneurs and he's building hundreds of businesses. When he gets done, he has put a lot of people into business that are selling seed. So it's an ongoing, perpetual motion process, and people are making money at it, so they continue to do it. And, you know, Simit has been part of that. We've been part of that. We grew, we grew a lot of seed, we did a lot of seed reproduction for, for a few years at our farm in South Africa for Simit, and they went up to some of those dealers and supported some of what Joe was doing. And so, 
the attitude that Joe portrays, number one is urgency. Number two is you just go do it. And he does crazy stuff sometimes. And you know, that's what I love about him. And the other is when I'm done, these guys are in business. More farmers are gonna get more seed and that's gonna keep growing. So I left something behind that works. I didn't leave somebody, I didn't leave a village behind that got fertilizer and seed for three years and now through a dependency actually has a bigger problem because they don't know what to do when the money's gone and the NGO's gone. So to me, Joe is the opposite of the mistakes that we've been making for a long time. I think I ought to just be a bit defensive about some of these NGOs that you've been, uh, otherwise my life is gonna be tough. Um, there are quite a number of NGOs these days that behave a bit like businesses. They're not for profit business, but they behave in a more business style. Um, I mean, I'm going next week to Uganda to look at the One Acre Fund, which is another way of getting seeds out across a large... Do you, have you seen that? It's called One Acre Fund. You've seen it? Okay, well... Good thing this isn't a test. <laughs> but this is a way of, of basically getting individuals in villages who are you know, have got some leadership capacity, providing them with seed and fertilizer, and they in turn then pass that on to others in the village. And so that it starts to multiply really fast throughout the whole system. Um, and I, I just don't, I was hoping you'd seen it because you could tell me whether it was sustainable or not, because that's what I really want to find well, out. Well, the, the question is, you have, you have to leave at some point. All we ever think about is our exit strategy, yeah, yeah. okay? When we exit, what happens? And it's not what happens the next day, it's what happens two years from now, five years from now. When you're, when you're dealing with water and food, those are important questions. So the question is, if you give that to people, they may try to multiply that, but three or four years after you're gone, What's it look like? That's the question. So I can't tell you what it looks like. I can only tell you what I know our experience has been. And our experience with that has been very disappointing. Because if you, you know, if you, if you, if you come into any system um, and interrupt it with something that doesn't fit the dynamics that are natural, you usually have a problem. And so, um, yeah. You know, you've, you've got to know when you walk away from it, can it sustain itself? And typically, if you've injected something, seeds, fertilizer, money, whatever it is, and you've injected it into that certain environment, but you're not there for, for because you're not there very long. You can even be there five years. That's not very long when you've got people who are trying to feed their family for 40 years. Yeah. So I think it's a very risky proposition. Okay. Let's talk about soils now, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about. Um, you love big machines. And I, I rode a, a great big uh, machine in Iowa last year, and I sat in a cab, and there was music coming out, and there was a refrigerator with beer and everything else. I thought it was great. But don't some of these machines cause some of the problems we've got now? Not all machines are good. Right? Well, you're, you're going right for the heart, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think they cause the problem. I think that it's how they're used that cause the problem. Um, you know, I've no-tilled for over 20 years. I use a 325 horsepower four-wheel drive tractor. But if I farm a certain way, then I don't worry about what that tractor's doing. Now, if I take that same tractor and I make five trips over the field with tillage implements, I'm doing damage. Yeah. I'm compacting the soil with both the tractor and, and, and the implement. I'm releasing carbon. I am making it very difficult for that plant to do what it naturally would do. And so I think it's, it's like a lot of things. You know, you, you can say automobiles are a great thing or they're a bad thing. It kind of depends on the driver. So, you know, I think the machine, the machinery is a tool. And obviously, when you look at a lot of African countries and a lot of farmers in Africa, not all of them, you know, those tools do them no good. 
absolutely no good. But there's other tools that will do things to help them. And so it's no different than when we started back home in, our, in, in, in the U.S. You know, you didn't start with big equipment and, and, and sophisticated things and GPS and all that. But if it's like most things. If it's used properly in the correct context in an appropriate manner, then it's a tool and it, it can be a good thing. What do you mean by the term Brown Revolution? Well, you know, I, I would, I, I think that the Green Revolution is well recognized for what it was. And Rockefeller, it's a legacy for Rockefeller. I mean, and it, it kills me that Rockefeller isn't doing what they did years ago. I mean, it, it's a huge loss to the world. It's a huge loss. And, and there's nobody <laughs> clapping over there. <laughs> but it is. I mean, part of why we're sitting here today is because of that. But, but the truth is, the Green Revolution was mechanization, synthetic fertilizer, improved seeds, all those things which are absolutely critical to successful production. But the truth is, if we don't take care of the foundation of what allows us to do that, which is the soil, then we lose in the long run. Great civilization, I mean, this, this is just history repeating itself. You know, you never recognize the problem until it's too late. The American Indians had a, uh, a, 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 something they follow called the seventh generation. And when they would make a decision, they had to speculate and think out how the seventh generation from today would be impacted by that. We think in seven hours, seven days, seven minutes. We don't think in seven generations. So if I look at the farm ground that I have, if I want to protect that farm ground, and I can still be just as productive. I don't give anything up except actually I make more money by doing it. And so the Brown Revolution to me is, the, and, and I think you call it the doubly green revolution. And I knew if I talked long enough he'd leave. Um, <laughs> and it isn't what we call it. It's the fact that we're embracing the fact that we need it and that we're talking about it. And so a brown revolution to me is we've got to save our soils. We've got to save our water systems. We've got to save our ecosystems. You know, everything that grows comes from a part of a natural environment. And if we destroy the natural environment, we have nothing that's left. And Joe's seed won't help us get out of that. Yeah, so we right. have to care that's about right. it. Yeah, right. I, you, I think oh. he's kicking us off the stage. I thought we had another. Okay, well, I've got a. I got, I got, hey, there's Gordon, holes, Gordon, I got holes. another couple of hours. We could yeah, have a mutiny right. here. Uh, when, <laughs> when you say wrap it up, you mean like in five minutes? Or, or like in a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. <laughs> we, we were going to talk about photography, and we were going to talk about philanthropy, and we we're going to talk about conflict, because he's done some great stuff on the relationship between conflict and, and food security, all of which you'll have to read in the book, because. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it. Um, uh, okay, I'll ask him a final question. Okay. Well, we could do another session tomorrow. Right. Um, I mean, you like me, you're, you're an optimist. Now, I, some people say it's just genes, and basically, if you multiplied a bit more, then there'd be more optimists in the world. But what makes you an optimist? Given what you've seen, you've seen terrible things in the world. I mean, in the book, it describes the boys in the, in the huts in, in Senegal that are chained up so they won't run away. You describe uh, terrible things in, in South Sudan and elsewhere that you've been. Why in this world, with all these problems, are you an optimist? Well... My wife calls me an optimistic pessimist, or a pessimistic optimist, I guess, a pessimistic optimist. And she's right to say it because, but to answer your question, I think when you see the worst things, when, when you've watched children die in front of their parents, which I have, and when you've, when you've seen kids that are in prison, like you're talking about in Senegal, you know, you walk away from that and you think it has to change. So if you're not going to be part of the change, it means you're part of the problem. And so you can't walk away from that and say, I'm doing nothing. And 
when I was very frustrated one time in, in, in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, I was with a, a longtime friend, Annette, who has spent years in that part of the world. And I was kind of a little depressed and saying things that, you know, I'm going to give up, kind of. And she just said, How? She says, Look at the people that, that are around here. They haven't given up on themselves. How can you give up on them? And so that's what makes me, I don't know that I'm really an optimist, but I'm somebody who thinks that you can't quit trying. You can't stop trying to make it better. And so if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job. And I'm just very fortunate, as you were, to have a lot of financial resources to try to do something about it. And we won't get it all right. But the key is, as we get things wrong, do we learn how to get more things right in the long run? Thank you. That's, that's a great answer. And, uh, I, I'm sorry there wasn't more time, but I do suggest you read the book because it's very inspirational and it's full of wonderful stories, some funny, some very sad. And out of it, you get a sense of this man and what he does and what he believes. And I th think we're very privileged to have had him here this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Howard. Thank you.